The man whistles softly as he walks. His mind is on work and the Monday ahead. And he's so lost in his thoughts that when he sees her, he's unsure for a moment if what he sees is real. In a few seconds, though, his brain registers the full horror of the scene. What he sees is a human being, but someone, a monster, perhaps, has left her in a state beyond comprehension. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 124, The Murder of Wilhelmina Mahlangu. This episode is sponsored by AdBot. Running this podcast is time-consuming. And, well, it's just me trying to get it all done. To keep True Crime South Africa up there as a chart-topping podcast, I can't afford to spend time managing my own online marketing campaigns like Google and Bing. Thankfully, there's AdBot. AdBot manages your Google and Bing ads, optimizing them around the clock. All you need to do is choose your monthly budget and let AdBot do the rest. If you're a fellow one-person team like me, visit myadbot.com to sign up and enjoy three months free. Use promo code TRUECRIME at checkout. A huge thank you to AdBot for sponsoring this episode. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And it's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time-consuming. And for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You? Yes, you. Are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Hanley Garrott, Samantha Ruinen, Fani LaRue, Andrea Fisher-Collett, Connie Ogilvie, Vilmarie Saliers, Janita Pretorius, Lizette Chamberlain, Janice Liebowitz, Arnold Langenhoven, Shimon Mann, Kristen Minnes, Matebe Mklongo, Diedrich, Inga, Liesel Phillips, Kerry Falconer, Andrea Ferreira, and Sharice for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much, everyone. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout-out on the pod, and other exclusive content, including Q&As with me, as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. I first heard about today's case when I was helping a documentary crew to research a few South African crimes for a series they were making. And I don't think I would have ever heard about it otherwise. There are a grand total of zero articles about it. And I will acknowledge it happened in 2003, so perhaps that accounts for no online footprint for the case. I am grateful, though, to be able to tell the story. Because not only does Wilhelmina deserve to be remembered, it's also a case with some very interesting themes of cover-up and assumption on board, where the way a crime presents at first 
is very different from what it actually is. So let's get into episode 124, The Murder of Wilhelmina Matlangu. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. When Wilhelmina lived in Klipchat in the northwest province in 2003, so 20 years ago, it was a very different place than it is today. She joined the police service in her early 20s and was working as an inspector at a police station one town over, and this meant she didn't really have to deal with any really terrible crimes. During that time, although the unemployment rate was high, the sense of community ties in Klipchat meant that there was very little violent crime. That has sadly changed over the years, and if you Google Klipchat today, you'll see many different pretty horrific cases come up. Philomena, though, had a relatively uneventful life, but also, according to her colleagues, was always up for a challenge. She enjoyed serving her community and was a well-respected police officer. In her personal life, she was looking forward to marriage and having a family one day, but she was also in no rush. She'd been living with her partner, Mbali and Tuli, for a few years, and neighbours said that the couple seemed happy, and they never heard any arguments or noticed any problems between the couple. Mbali was also well known in the community. He worked as a carpenter, and together he and Wilhelmina made a striking pair. Besides being a well respected police officer, Wilhelmina was also known for her excellent timekeeping and attendance record. Her superiors couldn't recall offhand a single day she'd taken off, and if she did need to be late, she would always call in. So, on Monday, the 11th of August 2003, when Wilhelmina did not arrive for her shift, her colleagues were immediately concerned. They did call Wilhelmina several times, but she did not answer. They called her partner, Mbali and Tuli, too. He initially didn't answer either, but eventually called back and let her colleagues know that as far as he knew, she'd left for work that morning. He said he'd have her call in when he saw her. But the shift passed, and Wilhelmina did not call in, and there was no sign of her either. One jurisdiction over, though, officers at Klipchat police station were on the move. That morning, a man walking to work had made a horrific discovery. He'd stumbled upon the body of a woman in a ditch next to a side path. The site had terrified him, and he'd run off to call someone to come back to the discovery site with him. But the neighbour had refused, and they'd instead phoned police, and waited at a distance from the body until they arrived. When Captain Corbe of Klipchat police station arrived on the scene, he understood immediately why the residents were hesitant to go anywhere near the area. Although this was certainly not the first dead body he'd seen, it would remain one of the most gruesome and tragic scenes he would ever attend. I will warn you that the following descriptions are extremely graphic. The reason the officer found the scene so shocking was because of what had been done to the victim's body. The woman had been completely decapitated. Her head was not found at the scene. Also missing were her breasts, which had been cut from her body, as well as parts of her genitalia. As more police officers arrived on the scene and a police photographer started to take photographs of the body and surrounding area, a crowd began to grow. The detective sensed a palpable fear begin to build among the people, and he knew exactly what it was about. To the gathered residents of Klipchat, the missing body parts spelled one thing, Muti murder. 
I've covered a few cases where initial allegations of Mutsi have been involved before, and I've explained the concept then, but I think it's worth explaining now for new listeners. The word Mutsi in Isizulu very simply means medicine. It links back to the long-held African traditional beliefs around certain plants and animal products providing specific healing qualities. In researching the possible links between Muti and murder, I found a chapter written by Dr. Gerard Labaskakni for the book Serial Offenders, which was particularly helpful. The chapter can be downloaded on Dr. Labaskakni's website, which actually has a bunch of really interesting downloads on it. As Muti practice is usually done by what most people would refer to as traditional healers, I thought it would be enlightening to read a short passage to you from that chapter which explains the difference between the various types of traditional healers before we get into how Muti sometimes links to murder in South Africa, other African countries, and sometimes even other parts of the world with immigrants of African descent. Quote, There are two main types of traditional healers in South Africa, the Sangomas, who consult with ancestors to determine the cause of a person's problems, and the Inyangas, who are herbalists. On a day-to-day basis, these practitioners intend no harm to the people they assist or to others. Lamprecht, reference 1998, claims that 84% of black South Africans seek treatments from traditional healers. It is the Mungome, or Vuloi, or Baloi, who is associated with harmful practices. It's important to emphasize that most traditional healers play a vital role in African society, often fulfilling the combined role of medical practitioner, spiritual guide, and psychologist. Traditional healers such as Sangomas oppose referring to those practitioners involved in muti murder as traditional healers and suggest that such individuals be referred to as witches. Traditional healers state that their form of assistance is aimed at helping people, whereas those who use their skills to bring harm to others, such as wanting someone dead, or who directly harm others in executing their duties, as in muti murder, should not be classified under the same term, traditional healer. End quote. So with that clarified, why and how might these Mgome be requesting that muti murders occur? Well, it's very simply for the harvesting of body parts. It is believed that certain body parts will assist in making strong muti that will help with various things, including attracting financial and business success and enhancing sexual prowess. If and when human body parts are sought for such muti, the victim must be alive when the body parts are removed. It's for this reason that muti murders are incredibly rare, and also extremely horrific, as the victim will essentially die of shock and blood loss from having the body parts removed while they're conscious. Of course, the Mungome are not usually committing these murders themselves. They'll often have people do it for them. It is almost impossible to say exactly how many true Muti murders occur each year, because they're not classified on their own for statistics purposes. But the estimation is anywhere between 15 and 300, which is a pretty wide range. Most Muti murders occur in rural areas in Limpopo, KwaZulu-Natal, and the Eastern Cape. As the crowd gathered around the gory scene in Klipchat began to murmur, Muti was the word on their lips. They'd never had a Muti murder in Klipchat. They were close to the border of Gauteng, and people that lived there had become very much city folk, and many had left their traditional beliefs behind. Of course, every one of the people gathered there still very much respected the beliefs they'd been raised with, 
It was an integral part of their identity. And no amount of exposure to more westernized beliefs could remove the fear that had begun to bubble up. The police officers did their best to reassure those gathered. They couldn't jump to conclusions. The investigation must be carried out, and even if it was murder for moody purposes, they would do their level best to catch those responsible. Looking at the scene, though, Captain Corbe had his doubts about it being a moody murder. The injuries incurred by the victim were significant and would have resulted in a huge amount of blood loss. Yet, even when they eventually lifted the body into a body bag, there was almost no blood on the soil underneath. From what Corbe knew of muti murders, the victim was usually immobilized and their body parts were harvested in one place, and the victim would be left there. It often occurred near water as well. Victims were not transported, and there was no body of water in sight. The fact that this was not the primary scene was soon confirmed, when a forensic technician spotted tire tracks and footprints nearby. Near the body, tracks told a story of how the victim had come to be there. Tire tracks led in from the dirt road to a spot near the ditch. Then, Deep shoe impressions led to where the body had been found and back from the body to where the tire tracks were. Significantly, the shoe impressions leading away from the vehicle were deeper, indicating that perhaps the person had been carrying something heavy, while the shoe imprints leading back to the vehicle were more shallow. The load had been put down. Forensics officers from the SAPS set about taking casts of these impressions. First, the best sections of the imprints were boxed off. Then, the soil is sprayed with hairspray to prevent the particles of soil moving around. Talc powder is scattered over the impression so that when the plaster is finally poured into the boxed-off section, the soil doesn't cling to the plaster. With these impressions taken and the body removed from the scene to the closest mortuary in preparation for autopsy, the scene was cleared, and the last remaining stragglers who'd stayed to witness all of the activity drifted away. The residents who'd been at the scene that day would, for a very long time, struggle to walk past the ditch without also seeing the body of the victim there in their mind's eye. Most did their best to avoid the area completely. Fear settled over Klipchat, like a blanket. Solving a murder case without knowing the identity of a victim is extremely difficult. As you would have heard me mention before on this podcast, this is because the vast majority of murders are committed by someone known to the victim. The investigation starts with the victim's closest family and partner and then moves outward in concentric circles, colleagues, neighbours, enemies. Without an identification, the connections are unknown. So the first course of action for investigators at Klipkart police station was to figure out who their female victim was. As soon as the investigating officer arrived back at the office, he started calling surrounding police stations to ask if they had any missing persons reports for adult black females. None had any that Monday. There were very few missing males and one missing child from a far-off station, but no females. The I.O. knew that during the autopsy fingerprints would be taken from the victim. These could be submitted to Home Affairs to determine whether they had a match in their system. The only other option was that someone would come forward in the interim to report their loved one missing. The press would be the last option. If no one came forward to claim the victim in the next 48 hours, the police press office would ask local newspapers to print an article about the murder. The victim's family may read the article and come forward. 
when he contacted the local police stations, he asked them to let him know if anyone came to their stations with missing person reports. By the afternoon of Monday the 11th, Wilhelmina Mchlangu's colleagues were extremely concerned. They'd had no choice but to continue on with their shifts for the day, but by the time one of the officers who was closest to Wilhelmina returned to the office to complete her shift, she received some news that disturbed her. The officer on telephone duty that day had told her that the body of a female had been found in Klipchat. The woman's blood turned to ice. Wilhelmina lived in Klipchat. Springing into action, she got the number of the I.O. from the desk sergeant and within minutes was on the phone with him. Could she come and view the body, she asked. The I.O. explained as carefully as he could that there would be no way to visually identify the victim from facial features. Wilhelmina's colleague then said that her friend had had a scar on her leg, which she would be able to identify. The I.O. agreed to have the woman come out to the mortuary. The woman and a fellow colleague started the 45-minute drive out to the mortuary where the unidentified victim's body was being held, and despite the terrible condition of the body, the minute she saw the scar on the victim's leg, she knew it was her friend and colleague, Wilhelmina Mchlangu. In photographs of Wilhelmina in her SAPS dress uniform, which consisted of a skirt, the scar was also clearly visible. With this initial identification, police were able to do a direct comparison of fingerprints taken from the body to fingerprints held on Wilhelmina's staff file. It was far quicker than waiting for a match from home affairs, and by the morning of Tuesday the 12th, it was confirmed. The unidentified body was indeed that of Inspector Wilhelmina Mechlangu. Wilhelmina's colleagues, friends and family were shocked. The young woman's horrific death was not something anyone could have seen coming, and her colleagues at the station she worked at were, in a way, grateful that they were not tasked with investigating her murder but also insistent to their fellow officers at Klipchat that they would do anything they could to assist. They had to find the person who'd done this terrible thing to their friend. As soon as Wilhelmina was identified, the investigation could begin in earnest. The autopsy on her body was conducted while the I.O. began other routes of investigation – and the pathologist called him with his findings early on Tuesday morning. The Mutsi murder theory could be discarded. Wilhelmina had been shot five times. Four of the bullets had exited her body, and one had remained behind, which was collected for possible comparison to any weapon which may be recovered. Another finding that proved that Wilhelmina had not been killed for Mutsi purposes was that the decapitation and removal of her other body parts had happened post-mortem. Police now knew that they were dealing with someone who had shot the woman to death and then tried to set up the scene to divert the investigation in a different direction. Several different routes of investigation would happen at once in these early hours. First, investigators attempted to make contact with Wilhelmina's live-in partner Mbali and Tuli. The man was not answering his phone, though, and although a death notification had been made to Wilhelmina's closest family members, the man, as her longtime partner, also needed to be notified, and he may well have important information, so talking to him was vital. Simultaneously, Officers had arrived at Wilhelmina's home and gained access. Ntuli was not there either, but as the property was part of a murder investigation and legally belonged to Wilhelmina, they began to search the house for evidence. The first thing police noticed was the distinct odour of cleaning detergent in the home. The kitchen and dining room were sparkling clean, 
and the smell of detergents continued on into the tiled hallway of the home. Nothing was out of place, and there didn't appear to have been any struggles within the home. Regardless, police went from room to room. Forensics would come in after them, but once they reached the main bedroom, all thoughts that nothing of evidentiary value was in the home were pushed aside. The bed was made, and the sheets were clean, but when the sheet was pulled back to reveal the mattress, they found several holes that appeared to have been made by bullets, as well as bloodstains. But the most pertinent discovery of all was made in the walk-in closet of the bedroom. There, on the floor between Wilhelmina's shoes, was a pillowcase, soaked in blood. Inside, police made a horrific discovery. The pillowcase contained Wilhelmina's severed head. In addition to this, in a pile of laundry, police found two guns. One would be identified as Wilhelmina's service pistol, and the other was registered to Mbali and Tuli. After the gruesome discovery, forensics teams scoured the house for hours. They found blood in multiple areas in the bedroom and on the tiles in the hallway, as well as a few other areas in the house. All the blood would be matched back to Wilhelmina. The blood had clearly been cleaned up by someone who had access to the house long after the murder had taken place. While all of this was unfolding, Mbali and Tuli's vehicle was spotted on a road near Kliprat. Police officers flagged him down, surrounded his vehicle, and took him into custody for questioning. It would not take much time for Mbali and Tuli to admit his involvement in Wilhelmina's murder under the heat of questioning. He claimed, though, that he'd had no choice and that he'd killed Wilhelmina in self-defense. Ntuli claimed that he and Wilhelmina had been arguing a lot in the past few months as he believed that she was cheating on him. He said that on Sunday the 10th of August, she'd come home after a day out with friends and they had started to argue. The argument had become heated and Wilhelmina had gone into their bedroom where she kept her service pistol and he heard her cock the gun. He told officers that he'd gone to retrieve his own weapon and when he entered the bedroom, Wilhelmina had her arm raised, ready to fire at him. He'd fired a shot at her arm, and then taken cover behind a dresser, and fired another two or three shots at her, which he believed had all hit her. Ntuli said that Wilhelmina had fallen onto the bed, and he'd taken her gun away from her, and then realised she was very badly wounded, and loaded her into the back of his car to take her to the hospital. He said that halfway there, she'd stopped responding to him and he'd realised that she'd died. He'd panicked and pulled over and dumped her body into the ditch where they'd found her and then he'd gone home. He said that when he got home though, he'd realised that he was going to be in big trouble and that police would definitely see him as a suspect. So he'd gone back to Wilhelmina's body and decapitated and mutilated her to make it look like a Muti murder. Ntuli was undoubtedly hoping that a self-defence claim would work to get him less jail time, but police were not buying it. And soon, the evidence would speak where Wilhelmina couldn't, and prove that Ntuli's story could not be true. The first important part of the evidence came from the guns and the bullets. Firstly, Wilhelmina's service weapon was not cocked when it was found. Ntuli had clearly said he'd heard her cock the gun, and after he'd shot her, he'd removed the gun and kicked it across the room. He did not say anything about uncocking the gun, even when he was asked about that portion of his evidence again. Although Ntuli had already admitted to shooting Wilhelmina with his firearm, he could retract his confession at any time, so it was still important to match up the bullet retrieved from Wilhelmina's body with Ntuli's gun. The bullets were a perfect match. 
The striations on the test fire bullets from his gun also matched a bullet found in the mattress, which had passed through Wilhelmina's body. Police used the trajectories of how the bullets had entered Wilhelmina's body and the mattress beneath her to understand exactly how the shooting would have taken place. The bullets had entered Wilhelmina in a downward and to the back trajectory. The only way this was possible, also taking into account how the bullets had entered the mattress, was if the shooter was standing over Wilhelmina while she was lying on the bed and shooting down on her from a standing position over her. Forensics officers did try to recreate the scenario that Ntuli had claimed happened, where Wilhelmina was standing facing the doorway of the bedroom with, with her own gun in her hand, and he shot at her first from the doorway and then from a position crouched behind the dresser, but they were unable to achieve the same trajectories. This clearly showed that Ntuli's version could not be true. The other portion of his story, how Wilhelmina came to be so brutally decapitated and mutilated, also did not hold water when they looked at it with the physical evidence. Ntuli's car was placed at the scene by matching the tyre impressions there to his car's tyres, and Wilhelmina's body had been placed in the back seat of the vehicle as her blood was found there too. But his claim that he'd been rushing her to the hospital and she died on the way and he'd left her body in the ditch and then gone back to stage a Muti murder could also not be true. The decapitation had most definitely not happened at the body disposal site because there was no blood there. The largest pool of blood appeared to have been in the tiled hallway of the home, and the officers would also find a knife in the kitchen with traces of Wilhelmina's blood on it. The pillowcase in which Wilhelmina's head had been found belonged to the set that had been stripped off the bed. So police believed that the most likely scenario was that Ntuli had done nothing to save Wilhelmina's life if, in fact, she had remained alive after being shot. Rather, he'd either waited for her to die, or she'd succumbed very quickly to the gunshot wounds, and then Tuli had performed the mutilations to her body in the home, likely on the tiled floor in the hallway where he believed he could more easily clean up the blood. He then loaded Wilhelmina's body into his car, put her in the ditch, and come back to the house. He'd stripped the bed using one of the pillowcases to hide Wilhelmina's head, and then put new bedding over the blood and bullet hole-ridden mattress. Police did believe that Wilhelmina and Ntuli had argued that night about her going out with friends, because it appeared that he'd started to become increasingly controlling. They believed that Wilhelmina had tried to end the argument by going into the bedroom to get ready for bed but Ntuli was not finished, and he'd followed her in there. The autopsy would show that Wilhelmina had been moving around on the bed while she was being shot, so it's very likely that she'd either already laid down to go to sleep, or Ntuli had pushed her onto the bed before opening fire on her. Although the murder did not appear to be premeditated, it certainly was not self-defense and Ntuli had lied about when he, he said he'd decided to, to mutilate Wilhelmina, indicating that he'd been far more clear-headed after the murder than he'd claimed. Mbali Ntuli was charged with the murder of Wilhelmina Maklangu, as well as the physical violation of a corpse. In court, he continued to claim that he'd acted in self-defence, despite the physical evidence pointing away from that probability. The judge did not accept his version and did accept the state's version that the killing was intentional, although not premeditated, and that he had mutilated Wilhelmina in an attempt to throw police off his tracks. Now, I will admit that the sentence in this case surprised me, and without having access to the judgment, 
It's difficult to know exactly why this sentence was passed down, but we do seem to go through waves of sentencing trends if you look back across history. And when Thule was sentenced in 2004, there certainly were other similar cases that also received similar sentences. Ntuli was sentenced to 20 years effective imprisonment. Now we know that means he's likely already come up for parole in the interim, and if he was not already granted parole, by next year he will have served his entire sentence and will be a free man if he is still alive. I can find absolutely no mention anywhere of his current status. Philomena's friends Family and colleagues were shocked when they discovered that Ntuli had been behind her murder. Although in intimate partner murders, we so often see a pattern of behaviour building up before the murder is committed, here it appears that things escalated from emotional abuse and controlling behaviour to deadly consequences extremely quickly. Of course, There's no way for us to know whether things were worse than they seemed and Wilhelmina was just hiding it really well. That's entirely possible. But there seemed no indication that Ntuli had been physically abusive to her before. And I think these types of cases are important to talk about because we don't want to get into a pattern of thinking that escalation to violence always occurs through certain steps. It's not always the case that an abusive relationship will escalate from emotional to physical abuse, and then only is it truly dangerous. Just as emotional abuse can be as damaging as physical abuse, it can also be as big a red flag to the impending possibility of escalation. Really, it all comes down to control, and it's clear that his was becoming an increasing issue for Ntuli. Wilhelmina was a strong, independent woman. She did not rely on Ntuli for housing or money, and although for a healthy partner these would all be positive attributes because the person is choosing to be with you and not needing to be with you, when you're dealing with an abusive or emotionally dysfunctional person, these positive attributes become negatives, further wounds to their already wounded psyche. For me, the fact that Ntuli was able to do such horrific things to Wilhelmina's body speaks to both a deep rage and also complete disrespect for her. After he had shot her, he was not horrified at what he'd done or desperate to try and save her, His instinct to protect himself immediately kicked in, and he spent significant time mutilating the body of the woman he claimed to have loved. Decapitation is not an easy thing to do. Most offenders do not complete the task because it is exhausting. Carrying such an act out with a kitchen knife would be even more difficult. And honestly, This is one of the things that makes the relatively short sentence that Ntuli got even more concerning to me. He didn't shoot her and run from the house yelling for help. He carried out this absolutely heinous act afterwards. I also can't help but wonder if there was a psychological element to him having mutilated her breasts and genitals, if he really did suspect her of having an affair. He claimed he did that simply because he thought those were the most common parts that were removed when a Muti murder is committed. I don't know so much. Either way, Wilhelmina did not, for a single minute, deserve how she was brutally killed and how she was treated after her death. The terror she must have experienced in her last moments as she watched her long-term partner suddenly loom over her and begin firing must have been horrendous. She remains a fond memory in the minds of her colleagues and friends. Those who were left behind had to find some way to move forward without their friend 
and the hard-working police officer who they so admired. The community of Klipkrat would not be the same after this brutal murder either. Wilhelmina was a well-loved resident, and even though it would be proven that her murder was not rooted in Muti, the cloud of fear that settled over Klipkrat did not really lift too much on that realization. Because it became clear that what had really happened had almost been worse. Wilhelmina had not been set upon by strangers seeking to harvest her body parts. She'd been gunned down in what should have been the safety of her own home, and then horrifically mutilated, not by a phantom moving in the night, but by the man she trusted and loved. Wilhelmina Mahlangu, rest gently. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then. Thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. Mm-hmm.